is the president, uh, president of the Community Evaluation Solutions, uh, an evaluation consulting for, firm that she founded in 2004. And much of her work has been, has been with community coalitions and nonprofits facing systems change. Um, she's been an active member of the American Evaluation Association and the Atlanta affiliate of that. And um, she has a podcast on community possibilities. I was honored to be her latest guest, which was fun. And her new her book that she co-authored with Susan is Community Consulting, a Practical Guide to Collaborating with Communities. Ed is gonna be a, 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 just a wealth of wisdom on the issue of uh, setting up and running a, a valuation firm as a community psychologist and also on her, her insights into that work. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anne. I, I will announce that we already have next month uh, lined up for January 21st with Dr. William Jackson and Dawn Henderson in their work from the Village of Wisdom, a, a phenomenal program around uh, working with uh, African-American kids and uh, you know, in a private uh, school setting. It's not a private school setting, it's uh, what do you call it? Anyhow, um, but it's, it's amazing work and they have beautiful manuals and I think we'll learn a lot then. So mark that in your calendar. And anybody who's interested in being the guest for February, drop me a line, I'm always hunting. So now let's turn it over to Anne. All right, well, Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are coming from. Uh, so let's start with, can everybody see my screen? I need that on a t-shirt. You're good to go. Yeah. Awesome. And are you looking at my notes or are you looking at the screen I want you to look at? Notes. Of notes. course you are. And I found out how to switch this this morning. Awesome. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. So I feel like I just got invited um, to a lunch where I actually know people. So <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. So I know Brian, I know Kyra, I know Susan, I know Judith, um, Michelle, we've actually met at the biennial a couple of years ago. And thank you, Tom, for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, and I want to talk to you about uh, my journey into this work and how I found a home as an evaluator. So I want you to know that I always introduce myself as a community psychologist and evaluator. Uh, I have never, I have not le uh, left my community psychology roots at all, even though I really hang out in AEA. Um, but for those of you who are involved in AEA, like I know Brian is very involved. Love the podcast, by the way, Brian. Um, uh, you'll find uh, you'll find a home as a community psychologist in AEA. So I want to tell you a little bit about me. So uh, one thing you should know is I love to travel. I'll go pretty much anywhere. Um, my husband is not as an adventurous. This is us at uh, on a glacier in Wrangell St. Elias in uh, 2019 in Alaska. Uh, and we hiked a glacier, right? Um, it was, wow, just amazing. And so this is my husband, two of my three sons. Uh, here's the oldest uh, with his wife, Louisa and Ellie. Isn't she so cute? She's four. And now David uh, is two. And we just uh, found out number three is on the way. Oh my gosh. Uh, so yeah, so things can get pretty um, busy around here around the holidays. Uh, and uh, the other thing you might uh, know about me is uh, I love to cook. I love to bake. I love to host folks. And um, I always tell people, if you're going to follow me on Instagram, you're just going to see a lot of bread and a lot of food. So like a lot of people, I taught myself how to make sourdough bread during the pandemic. Uh, so when I'm not hanging out with the fam or making sourdough bread, uh, I might be hanging out with my business uh, bestie, AKA Susan Wolf. And uh, we might be teaching about coalition evaluation or collaborating in communities. Uh, when I'm not working with Susan, I actually do do other work. Um, 
Susan's always a lot of fun though. Uh, I work mainly in the mental health sub substance abuse uh, space. I sit on the evaluation team for Georgia Family Connection. So I spent a lot of time in rural Georgia. I love doing that. Um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about my work as we go on. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my career uh, trajectory. So I grew up in Florida and I always knew I wanted to get my PhD. I don't know why, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. Um, I knew it was going to be a science, um, but found out uh, it was only the ologies that I liked. Didn't really like physics, didn't really like chemistry, but psychology, biology, anthropology, you name any of the ologies I loved. Um, so I went to West Florida, I got my bachelor's degree there, and like many of you, I bet you can relate to this, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist when I grew up. Um, my master's is actually in clinical psych. So um, when I, well, right before I graduated, I was just crunching my numbers. Uh, Dan and I moved to Atlanta and I finished um, my master's degree. I looked around at some treatment centers, thought maybe I would do that, but I actually landed a job at Rockwell International. Yeah, the Rockwell, like make bombs, Rockwell International. And I actually called my um, thesis chair, who was, a, um, who was a wonderful hippie named Sam. And I said, Sam, will you hate me if I take this job? And he said, how much are they paying you? Anyway, somebody talked me into it, that it was industrial psychology. I stayed a couple of years, absolutely hated it left. Um, as I've done this before, I've taken step back in my career in order to move forward, uh, started building a uh, private practice. And when I wasn't doing that, I was working as a mental health tech in a treatment center here in Atlanta. And that's kind of where I uh, was for quite a bit of time. I worked in the clinical space, primarily with uh, folks uh, who uh, had uh, substance abuse disorder. We didn't call it that then, but I primarily worked with adolescents. Did that for about five years and got really, really burnt out. And I mean like exhausted burnout. Um, a lot of the kids that we worked with were very ill. We had um, kids that were addicted to uh, heroin and meth and all sorts of pretty serious um, drugs. I had a 14 year old heroin addict from San Antonio, Texas. Um, but the, I guess the case that really changed the trajectory of my career was when I had to fly a, a young lady to Arkansas and commit her to a state hospital. We had kept her as long as we possibly could. Uh, she was 14 years old when she came into treatment, just barely 14. She had had a baby and had abused the baby pretty severely. Um, and she was very, very ill. Uh, we, we kept her three months past when her insurance ran out and she just needed what we could not provide. And I, as the lead therapist, was responsible for flying her back to her home and institutionalizing her. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Surely there has got to be a better way. And I mentioned my um, thesis chair, Sam, and I, um, I remembered what Sam had told me. I actually wrote about this in my prelims paper for my PhD at, at Georgia State about, we had to write a paper on who I am as a psychologist. And the title of my paper was Sam was right all along because when I left Pensacola, he said, you know, you're an applied psychologist. You're really meant to be out in the community. And one day you will figure that out. And so I did. So I found the community site program at Georgia State. My husband was settled here in a career. So I was not going to be going all over and figuring out um, or going to uh, applying to a lot of PhD programs. So luckily, I got into the one school that I applied for, Georgia State. Um, fun fact, uh, I found out I was pregnant with number two about the time I was getting into graduate school. Um, the theme of being a professional and being a mom weaves through my whole um, career, and I'm happy to talk about that as we uh, go on. Um, but suffice it to say, I was basically told by other folks who were in the program to never talk about the fact that I had children. 
Um, so graduate school was a very interesting experience for me. I had um, two children going in and just because I like symmetry, I had one kid going out. We can talk about that too. So um, as it would have it, so fast forward several years later, it took me, uh, I'm embarrassed to say seven years to get out of Georgia State, primarily because I tried to take every summer off to be with the kids. And truth be told, probably because maybe I was a little bit afraid that somebody was gonna tap me on the shoulder and say, excuse me, you're not smart enough to be here. Um, that I'm just being really honest and transparent. But at the end of all that, um, I, I met with my dissertation chair and um, she said, you know, the folks in the department have talked and they think you'd be a really great academic and we'd love to support you in getting a position it means you'd have to go wherever there's an opening. Needless to say, I was very flattered, but I'm thinking, hmm, how's this gonna work? So uh, as luck would have it, I was supposed to have lunch with my husband that day. And I said, hey, you know, uh, Fran told me, this is what Fran told me, what do you think about that? And he was completely silent. And after about a minute or two, I looked at him and said, wow, you know, it's a good thing that um, it doesn't mean that much to me. <laughs> I really didn't see myself as someone who would um, thrive in that kind of environment. I love, te I love teaching. I still love teaching. I love writing. I just didn't see myself in an academic um, setting. So I think I made the right choice. Uh, had a couple interviews for, for some fellowships, considered that road, but by the time I paid for childcare and um, parking in downtown Atlanta, I was basically going to be paying to do a fellowship. So decided not to go that route. Uh, I was teaching at a local university as an adjunct and got a job at uh, ICF. It's now known as ICF back in the day, it was known as macro. And I worked uh, part-time there and I say part-time, but when there was deadlines or a congressional report or a proposal due, um, my part-time went from 20-ish hours a week to 40 plus. And I watched the other folks um, who were full-time some of them work 60, 70 hours on a regular basis. Uh, so I, at that point, my youngest was about to go into kindergarten. I went to my supervisor and asked her about um, what she saw, what did she see my career going forward at, at, at macro or at, at, at the company? And um, she obviously had me pegged on the mommy track because her response was, well, I don't know, you've had such a limited career here. Like, okay, that's really interesting. I'd started like an internal work group on uh, child mental health and uh, outcomes. I was part of a big uh, national child mental health study. I, you know, chaired, you know, several plant panels, had published all of the things as a part-time person, but I had a limited role. About that time, this was about 2004, and some of you may recall there was a big crisis going on in the Catholic Church. So I got a call from a friend of mine who was head of Catholic Charities asking me to come down and be a head of the Office of Child and Youth Protection. And so I left my um, uh, job at ICF. And I had stopped teaching at this point and took that position. It was in the height of the crisis. Um, it was in the news every day. There were auditors flying around everywhere. We probably don't have time for me to explain everything that happened, but just suffice to say that it took about four and a half months for them to fire me. They got really tired of uh, hearing uh, all the things that they were not um, doing uh, wrong. I love the uh, article that um, Jim Imshoff was one of my professors at Georgia State. He had us read by uh, Rory O'Day on um, reaction to reformers. Uh, Susan, myself, and another colleague, Martha Brown, actually presented on this topic at AEA a few years ago when we uh, the theme was speaking truth to power. Um, so I landed on the front page of the paper, not a fun place to be, uh, and I cried for nine months. Um, they fired my uh, friend Jim right after they fired me. 
Uh, and after about nine months of crying, uh, what do you do when uh, you get fired so publicly? You start your own business. Um, and here's, uh, here's the funny thing, uh, folks. When I looked back, I was cleaning out something uh, in the office. I found a box and I found a little card where I had written the name of my company. I had written this tagline, Partnering for Social Change. Aha. It's a sign, right? I remember um, crying to my, my spiritual director, Sister Susan, about, I always wanted to work for the church. And she's like, you're going to have to change your definition of church. So I founded um, CES in, uh, like I said, 2004. I got my first client within a few weeks. I got a lot of encouragement from folks who said, just hang out your shingle. You're going to have more work than you possibly can imagine. And now nearly 20 years later, I have um, a successful uh, six-figure business. So I'm pretty pleased with that. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the American Evaluation Association. It is the professional home for evaluators or uh, Brian is on. So the Canadian Evaluation Society, which I'm also a member of is also very fabulous. But my primary home is AEA. I've been a member since 1999. The great thing about owning my own business is I get to be a member. I get to go to conferences. When I was at Macro, I was a, a small fish, so I didn't I have that luxury. I have been chair of the community site TIG and part of that leadership team. I followed um, Teresa Armstead in that role, learned a lot from Teresa. I've also been um, the co-chair of the nonprofit and foundations TIG and sat on that leadership team for three years. I'm part of the TIG scan committee. I present at AEA almost every year probably since I've joined, I would say. And then at the Summer Institute that is held in Atlanta, um, which is very workshop oriented. I blog for the AEA 365. I mentor new and emerging, new and emerging evaluators in office hours twice a month. And I, along with uh, Susan, uh, support the IC topic chats with Matt Feldman, which are every uh, Thursday. So I'm very, very, very involved in AEA. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my business post uh, pandemic. So in March of, gosh, was it 20, I guess this would have been 2021, I think that was, it was about the time when um, all of the uh, things that were happening in the country, not just the pandemic, but um, here in the Atlanta area, or not the South, South Georgia, Maud Aubrey was murdered, you have George Floyd. Uh, like a lot of folks, I was exhausted and anxious and really frustrated. I'm looking at the where I am in my career and wondering, am I really making a difference? So I cleared my schedule, uh, uh, went out to my deck. It was, a it was a beautiful March in Georgia and spent the entire week rewriting my business plan and digging into you know, am I really making a difference and what am I going to do? So my new business model, I have no employees. I only um, work with uh, senior level evaluators uh, and we only focus on coalition work and social change work. So that has been a huge, tremendous shift in my business. So I wanted to share just a few insights about, you know, if I could do it all over again, uh, one, I would get in and out of school faster, definitely. Um, I would ask for what I need as a, as a mom. Um, I have, I have had the privilege and the blessing to mentor a lot of, uh, new and emerging evaluators, but also new and emerging community psychologists who go off to graduate school. And I always tell the young women to ask for what they need. If they need a place to nurse, um, ask for it. If they need, um, support or their child is sick, you know, it is what it is. Don't apologize. Don't listen to the people who had told me, hey, don't ever talk about the fact that you have kids. Um, I would definitely try to be more confident. Of course, confidence only comes with experience. We know that, right? Um, and I would probably get a business coach uh, earlier. That's what I'm doing this afternoon. I have a two-hour strategy session with my business coach. I have a pretty good intuitive business sense. I've been pretty successful. Um, but like a lot of folks who are evaluators and independent consultants, I don't have a business degree. 
So um, what's next? Um, as Tom uh, mentioned, I do have a, a podcast. I really did this because I was really frustrated with the kind, the level of or lack of communication going on in our communities. Um, thank you, Tom, so much for being on the podcast. That was fabulous. Um, it's really for me, I, I, I just want to have conversations with people who are doing great work. Uh, and like I said, we're really leaning into that community change work. That's really where I want to spend um, the rest of my career. So that's pretty much it for my presentation. I would love to connect with you. I shared my email. I am on Twitter. The, book, uh, the, the company is on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. And then, of course, I have the podcast. So I am happy to take this conversation wherever you want to take it. We can dig in about evaluation. We can talk about the business. I can tell you um, about the fun times I had trying to uh, do social change from inside of the bureaucracy of the church. We can go wherever you want to go. So anyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat. Or if you would like to use the reactions to raise your hand to share your question. It's rare that we get a chance to hear someone trace their career and their decisions. And I wonder, as people listen to it, what their thoughts were. Oh, here comes something from Jerry. That'll be good. Uh, should I raise my hand? Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, Carrie, yeah. do you want me to put a hand in there? Oh, no, I, I was just saying Helena had her hand raised too, just in case Tom didn't see it. I got you. Okay, uh -huh. yeah, I, yeah, I, Judah has a question too. I can go if you, if that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask when you uh, mentioned you were meeting uh, Anne. Hi, Anne, this is Jerry Palmer. I don't know that Hi we there. met, but pleasure to meet you. And, and uh, um, I just had a quick question around, did you have any, particular criteria when you selected a business coach, you know, how did that work for you? If you don't mind, how did you um, get, you know, get there, which is a great thing, but I'm just wondering, um, you know, criteria or uh, what might be the, um, uh, you know, what, what um, thoughts you had about who and, and that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Sure. I put a call out to the independent consulting e-list, which is basically, think of it as an internal listserv for the independent consultant topical interest group. I should have explained what a TIG was, a topical interest group within AEA. I got a couple of recommendations. I interviewed two of the people and I picked the person that scared me the most. Got it. Okay. How did they, scare, yeah, quickly, how did they scare you? What? Yeah. She got me. She got me, she could see, um, she could see my strengths and, and I do have a really good business sense, but she also knew where I, she could tell where I was holding back. Got you. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. So Judith asks, how do you currently find social change projects and was there a lull in work when you made the shift? Um, you know, I, I Judith, um, this is my like, like spiritual mindset. So it may not resonate with uh, you, you or other folks. I don't know, but I feel like my company is uh, the Lord's way of saying, thank you for doing the right thing. Uh, and here's my thank you. <laughs> um, so I really have not. And because I guess because I do a lot of community coalition work anyway, um, even if they don't think they're doing systems change, that's what I bring to the table. I make that really clear when I'm having those initial client meetings. I talk about being a community psychologist. I talk about uh, a public health approach to prevention, socio-ecological models, all of those kinds of things. So they, they get what they get when they get me. So I really have not seen you know, a lull in that work. Helena? Hi, Anne. My name's Helena. 
Um, I am a community psych PhD student right now at DePaul, and I am moving to Florida in the summer with my fiance to kind of try to set roots. And we're moving to the Gulf side for family reasons, but I can't seem to find anything in the area. So I've kind of come to terms with the idea of I need to make my own path if there's nothing that's already there. Um, but so I'm wondering what you know, you, you had like a, what would you do now, like looking back, but were there any of those experiences that you think set you up for your current success, like retrospectively, like indirect experiences that you think I could try to get on my path? Yeah. Um, and I'm from Fort Walton Beach originally. I don't know where on the Gulf Coast you're uh, moving from, but I, I, I love it there. Except, well, there's some things about Florida I like, but we don't have to talk about that. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I, what I always tell folks is if you can um, have something to sell, have a hard skill that you can sell, right? And even though there might not be a, a big social science research firm like ICF or um, Mathematica or Battelle or any of those big shops there, Helena, in this post-COVID space, working virtually is a thing. So I would think really broad, right? That, that would be the first thing. I would think about um, joining AEA. The uh, fee for a student is pretty low. And then you would have access to the independent consulting TIG, the IC chat. You're always welcome to my office hours, right? Um, because it might be that you do kind of create your own thing and there's no need to um, start from scratch right? There's so, I just said this in my office hours right before this call, there's so much more support for people who are wanting to do evaluation consulting. Um, and evaluation is a perfect space for community psychologists who really just don't see themselves as an academic, right? Um, it just, it, it's so aligned with our values. It, we, we bring some skills and knowledge and all of our research, our, our study to this work. So whether you work virtually for a social science firm or go out on your own, I mean, I can give you more specific tips. Gail Barrington has a, has a book that most people start with. It's called Consulting Startup and Management. Um, it's, it's getting to be a little bit uh, dated, uh, but it still has really good um, uh, tips and tricks, right? And, and then I would just say anything that, that involved in AEA. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. And you will be seeing me in your office hours. Thank you. There you go. Awesome. Mo has a wonderful question. I think she's next in Chicago. Uh, <clears throat> did you find your beginnings working with substance abuse disorder, mental health populations? Oh, for sure, right? Um, because most of my clinical work was in that space. So it was just, um, it was just a shift, right? From the clinical side to, to prevent, I don't, the other thing about me is I don't see evaluation as the tail end right? I, you know, I still, I can see, you know, Lewin's model in my head, right? So all of this to me is a continuum of work. It's not just um, something that I bring in on at the end, but certainly that, uh, that work in mental health and substance abuse really helps me speak to prevention folks, to nonprofits who are working in um, this space, um, because I understand what that treatment looks like. Uh, we also have a, a family history of substance abuse in our family. So, you know, and, and if we're all honest, we all come to this work for a reason, right? Um, so all of those things helped me, right? And then you pivot, right? So I, you know, I have this part of the business that's focused on mental health and substance abuse, but I was able to expand out into other areas like public health, for example. One of the things you're saying implicitly is that you really didn't have to do a lot of PR to build the new business when you shifted. And I think uh, you're really talking about how if you do good work, uh, it, it flows and you put it, and I would agree, you put it out to the, to the universe that you're open to new work. So there's a spiritual belief part of it, mm -hmm. but it's also true. Uh, you know, I set up an elaborate website, da, 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 but almost everybody who contacted me 
knew someone I'd worked with and then came to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the dominant way. Would other people here agree with that? Yeah, I see a lot of nodding. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> those are the people who know how good you are. Right. You know, and I guess I would say it helped, definitely word of mouth. I, I, I agree with Tom. I don't think I've ever gotten a client through my website, nor would I kind of want to. It's fine if they, to me, it's like a legitimate space. They see, oh, she actually has done things, right? Um, but especially in the evaluation space, those relationships are so critical, right? And as an independent consultant, you get to choose who you work with, right? You can, you can say that we're not all supposed to work with every person, um, I, I do get a lot of like word of mouth uh, kind of thing. And I guess the only other thing I want to say that brings to mind something that Tom said is um, there's also a lot of bad evaluation out there, right? Um, people are already nervous about evaluation. They kind of think about it as like going to the dentist, right? They kind of have to do it. Um, so I'm, I can be pretty charming when I want to be. So I can usually con people into like, this is fun. This is important. This is how we know we're making a difference. Um, so I bring that to, you know, this space as well. And if you do things well, you are going to develop that reputation and, and, and work will come to you. Ryan, will you, will <laughs> I you saw please verbalize that and we can all talk about it. Where are you, Ryan? Your chat comment. Yes. Uh, just what Anne was saying around, uh, uh, yeah, some people see it as going to a dentist. Some have had negative experiences with other folks who, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and actually uh, uh, up here, um, uh, Kim Vanderwoord, who's an Indigenous evaluation consultant on the West Coast, uh, um, she's talked about uh, how evaluation can often, often be weaponized against uh, organizations and communities, uh, whether by funders or by uh, um, by municipal or government partners and such. So mm -hmm. that's one thing to be aware of in doing the work is that some people actually may have had rather negative experiences around evaluation and uh, we need to be able to talk about how do we use it as an opportunity for learning and growth uh, mm -hmm. and and promoting value, good values instead of uh, uh, the over focus on accountability that most people associate with it. Well, your yeah. comment is, I remember one client who would twitch if anyone mentioned logic model in his hearing. And uh, I would twitch when people said that. And there was a wonderful article in the Global Journal by Greg Meissen and some students at uh, uh, Wichita on a logic model that never used the word. And Kyra, were you part of that? that there no, was but I use it. I use it often. <laughs> go through all the steps of the logic model without calling it a logic model. You just sort of ask these <laughs> questions. And then um, at, at the end, you say, oh, so this is you know what some people call a logic model. And they've done it. And they haven't been terrified by it. Yeah. Maybe I, I even have to use the phrase fearless logic model. I use it yeah, all fearless. the time, especially with folks who have had a negative experience. Um, it's pretty, pretty fabulous, actually. And, you know, I think evaluators, um, we really get hung up in our language, right? And, you know, what the heck is an output anyway, right? That, that language does not mean anything to community people. So as you, you guys know, right, we have to speak the language of the group that we're, trying, that we're, we're working with, for sure. Program Al, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I, just a minute ago, we were all talking about networking, about using the word. And I'm wondering uh, to what extent do the gra current graduate programs teach people networking skills? Uh, well, I've been out for 20 years, so I'd like to hear from the students about that one. I've been out 40. <laughs> I, I as I've started a, oh, oh, sorry, Helena. Oh, no, you go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, I just started the community psychology program at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and took my first program eval class this past semester. And it was excellent, which is why I'm here today. Um, but as far as networking, that wasn't so much of a focus. It was more about the logic model. Mm -hmm. there was a lot, sorry, there was a lot that we did talk about um, being very aware of how much um, time and um, not burdening the client with information gathering and being very aware of time and respect and how much in collaboration 
um, that you are asking as much as people want to give and, and meeting people where, they're, where they are. Mm -hmm. So I think that relates to networking, but it wasn't specifically talked about as such. Others want to comment on that? Mo? So I'm, I'm a doctoral candidate at uh, National Lewis University in the Community Psych Program. And um, I can say that like from the beginning, um, not only do they incorporate, uh, you know, how important networking is in, in our uh, coursework, but they also model the, the behavior, right? Because they make connections all the time. It's like, I don't want to meet nobody else, but I really do, right? It's like, I think you should meet this person. You should meet that person. And there's all these introductions. And I think that, um, you know, it's really helped me uh, to see the value in that and then to do that for other people as well. So I do it for my other classmates. I do it in the community all the time. I'm just now able to like really put a name on it and a meaning to it. Um, so uh, yeah, the NLU Community Site Program does a great job at, again, putting it into the, the coursework. And I'm talking each course. It's not a course that we have that is not at least mentioned that connect with this person or connect with that. Mm -hmm. um, but especially like in the evaluation class or the consultation class, um, there's a real big emphasis put on it. And again, modeling that behavior is probably the best way to teach us. And Mo actually did it and we connected and we're working yes. together on every other week yes. basis. Oh, nice. <laughs> on the new bank. Yep. Kyra, do you, Kyra, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, so I had a, a general question, mostly for um, like early career community psychologists and evaluators. But, um, you know, and I know that you've been both um, fired and <laughs> um, <laughs> and with, withdrew from different projects. Um, something that I don't think it's talked about enough, especially in the service of early career folks is um, kind of where you get to that point of, uh, you may have those values, but I think sometimes there's a difference between knowing, you know, and, and honoring your values, but then when your early career, it's like, okay, do I hold on to this opportunity because I do need, you know, X, Y, Z. And so could you speak to um, I guess, um, like that point where you decided, okay, this is what I'm going to put into practice. Like, I can't, I can't do this no more in terms of, you know, it, it may be accepting things or following through on things that don't necessarily align with, um, you know, the values that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyra, is that, can I rephrase it, make sure I understand what you're asking? Um, sure. Are you, are you basically asking, um, how do I know when to fire a client? How did you get to that point? I think sometimes there's a perception that like among seasoned evaluators or community psychologists that you've always just kind of um, been at that state of, I accept things that, you know, align with my values. But I would imagine that you had to kind of get to a, a level of like comfortability of you know, maturity in the, in the sense that this is where I've, this is that cutoff point where I've decided that I'm no longer doing X, Y, Z, but I would imagine gotcha. it wasn't a light switch type yeah. of process. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, my first contract, I think I was doing focus groups for a school system. And then I think I evaluated what well, I didn't think, I know I did. I evaluated the office of smoking and health, the big workshop that they did. That's not really Right. So to your point, yeah, in the in the very beginning, I, I took those kinds of contracts, right? As I matured, developed that identity, um, I could I could be more thoughtful. I wasn't thinking about, oh, I'm trying to build, you know, this business. What I try to do um, a lot is uh, be a, be the the pitch meeting, right? That first meeting now I'm very transparent in the kind of work that I do, how I work. I talk about a participatory approach and what that means. Here are my values. I lay it all out. So hopefully they're going to filter out if that doesn't 
kind of align. So yes, that's true. In the beginning, I didn't necessarily, you know, I wasn't doing coalition work the, right out of the gate, right? Um, but that has developed over time. And as I have, let's just say, matured in my career, I'm about to have a big birthday in February. I'm not even gonna tell you what number. Um, uh, I, I feel like time is, I'm just being really, I don't know how to, I'm just so transparent. I don't know how to be anything but me. I feel like my time is running out. I have limited time to make a difference in this world, in my career. I don't have time for nonsense. Um, so I fired a client in November of 2019. She, Susan knows this story, right? She's heard, but she heard me complain about this person for years because she was not engaged in the work. I felt like I was the checkbox for her. Yes, I have an evaluator. She didn't approve a plan. She never was involved in logic models. I could never get her to approve a report. And she was part of my, yeah, I'm done with, I'm, I'm, I wish you well, go find somebody else. Um, and this is not, maybe not related to Kyra's point, but it was something I forgot to say is when I started my business, I'm very clear that I um, look a certain way, that I have a certain kind of economy that allows me to, uh, that allowed me to start my business. I was married. I had a husband who had a good job, who had insurance, right? So I don't want you to think that, well, it just magically all happened. I had a lot of support around me to allow me to do this. This is a great conversation. And if the group is willing, we should just keep going with it a bit. The question that Kyra raised and, and what you're going, because the idea of firing a client, you never, there's never a course called how to fire a client <laughs> with case examples. And when you first start talking about it, other people look at you and you're, are you crazy? I'm trying to build a practice. You got rid of someone. And, you know, this is where especially the ideas of social change and, and, and the importance of, uh, if you're dealing with issues of health equity and stuff, of racism, you got to say it, say the word, mm -hmm. and then people start running for the door. But if you don't say the word, what are you going to do? Right. Make, in, the, in the second or third year, people will be comfortable enough to start talking about what the real issue is. So it's a very tricky business. And I think we need to do a better job of supporting each other. Um, I can think of a contract with, a, you know, with uh, a huge uh, organization, CMS, where I was invited in with a couple of other people to do some work and it was on renal disease. And at the first meeting, they showed a video of uh, a presentation they'd done where the, there are only a limited number of uh, dialysis units in a city and they'd rejected somebody because they were all owned by the same person. They said, you're not allowed to come back in. He happened to be a white, a dark, a black man. And I thought, really? And I said, well, what's the statistics? And oh yeah, it's predominantly black men. And I said, well, what is that about? And they said, well, you know, they're so big and the nurses are so little. And I thought, oh, we've got a lot of work to do here. And, but the person who had hired me understood it. And we worked with it enough so that I was then able to bring in a couple of years later an African, a very articulate African-American health executive who had uh, uh, kidney disease and was talking about how hard it was for him to go through the system. But it took some work. Uh, but you can't back away from asking that question because otherwise that issue, which drives a lot of the statistics in um, kidney disease won't be dealt with. And I thought to myself, am I gonna really do this in my very first meeting with all these people? But I did. Um, and I'm happy I did because the person who was running it appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And then we can move forward. But it's a very tricky business. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if other people have been in that spot, but firing a, 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 a consult, a, someone who's hiring you is an interesting idea. Susan? Anne will remember a case where I needed to fire a client, but it was really hard. And it was Anne who was also a subcontractor on this very large project that was our dream project to do. And then it turned into a nightmare. Um, basically, we were speaking truth to power and that didn't go down well and it got nasty. And it was hard for me to 
to uh, admit to that. It's very hard to come to that point where you're ready to say, this is not going to work. And it was Anne who kind of like really was like, I would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And Kyra, that's a great idea about a whole book about case studies of firing clients. <laughs> All right, Susan, that's book number four. <laughs> yeah, we have enough going on with books here. How many people want to and, sign up for a chapter? <laughs> and you a might chapter I could in, do. You might want to put in that plug right now <laughs> for the book. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think that speaks to, um, you know, community psychologists talk a good game when it comes to values. Living them is hard. Yep. But what choice do you, I mean, integrity is a really strong value for me. I don't, I don't know how you function if you don't have integrity. Just saying. So I put in the chat the link to the Google Drive and the YouTube channel. We did talk about on the um, on one of my sessions, office hours, and I, I'm pretty sure this is up on the YouTube. I had a guest come in, Colleen Manning. She's a fellow evaluator. She's from Massachusetts. And she talked about uh, dealing with conflict in relationships. That would be a great one. Um, and I, uh, Matt, you saw, or Susan, you saw where I shared her information with Matt in the IC chat. So hopefully she'll come in. Um, handling conflict, knowing when to fire a client. Those are all really great skills that we might teach. We might get a program evaluation class in our graduate program, and we might get uh, a developing a sh program class, but we don't certainly don't get how to manage a consulting business or how to set up a, a handle a budget or, uh, you know, what, what are your principles as an independent consultant? What are you going to do when reality hits? Well, we don't get that. <laughs> we don't get that. But I will tell you what Georgia State did that I really appreciate is um, uh, it was never, and I don't know, you know, I, I mean, I, I know the folks there, but I, I, I'm not a student there anymore. But when I was there, it was okay that I didn't want to be an academic. You know, did maybe they were disappointed in my answer, but um, I was not ostracized. I was not judged. Um, it is okay in that space to think about uh, practice, applied community psychology as a perfectly acceptable profession to have. And thank goodness, more and more graduate programs are like that. But even 10 years ago, there were people who would come up to people like Susan and me at, at the uh, biennials and say, they tap you on the shoulder, are you really just a practitioner? <laughs> and I, my, I, when I tell my faculty that that's what I wanna be, they say, you're gonna have to find another supervisor. Um, so there are more and more programs who now that's a valued uh, position, but for many, and I think there's still some, uh, where if you're not going into academia, you're not uh, doing what we hoped we were doing when we took you in the program. Yeah. Other questions, other topics, we've shut other people down from other things. I hope not. Al? I'm going to ask a question about working in a religious organization. Ah. I'm not asking about the troubles of the, of the Catholic Church, but <laughs> culturally, culturally speaking, uh, what differences did you notice in working in a religious organization as compared to uh, secular organizations and businesses out in the community? Oh, I'll tell you a fun story that will illustrate this. Um, uh, back then, all of the archdiocese had to have a advisory council to make sure that they were doing the right thing, right? There was someone on the advisory council that I knew um, who called the uh, office, uh, the, the bishop's office in Washington, D.C. I won't go into the lingo, but just say the bishop's office, the mothership in Washington, D.C., and complained about the Atlanta archdiocese. And I knew about it. And I didn't say anything. I felt like that was within her right. I, I did not go tattle to the bishop's office that she had done this and they found out because the folks in charge, I don't know, they met, they, they mentioned, unfortunately they mentioned it. So in comes what I, what I called um, 
the intimidation squad. Here comes the vicar and the vicar general and the head of HR. And they are coming to my office. And I remember like, oh shit, I'm about to get fired. I did not get fired. Is it okay to say shit on this? Um, uh, I'm about to, I didn't get fired that day, but I'm looking out the window. I see my husband's um, office building. There's Coca-Cola and uh, I'm, one of the one of the Bickers general says to me, we're so lucky to be working here. It's such an, it's just an honest, you know, place. We're just so lucky to be working in this culture. And I'm looking at my husband's office, thinking to myself, not saying it out loud, of course, that I have never been in a more dysfunctional, dishonest environment in all my life. I hope that answers your question now. This, Judah, you, you have a comment on there and maybe that'll be how we close it up, but I think it's an interesting one about the book. Or maybe Jerry wants to get in on it. Sure, yeah, just to follow up on the earlier part of the conversation about uh, the need for sharing stories and, and cases, uh, examples, that we can all learn from in terms of when when we need to fire clients, how to fire clients, um, what the what the rationales are, um, and there's a, a a work in progress that will be an ongoing work in progress. That's a case studies book that Jerry is the lead editor on, um, and I included the link in there. You're welcome to check it out and encourage anyone who's interested in writing a case. And the, your case could be a chapter. It could be part of a chapter multiple people could join and team up on it. Um, we're looking for, for innovative ways to share the information. It can just like global journal articles, it can include photos, images, videos, uh, any other um, innovative ways of sharing the information. Anything to add to that, Jerry? Uh, hang on. Yeah, hang on. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I was just sending something in the chat. Thanks, Judah, uh, sending something in the chat. Did it Did it get in there? Uh, oh, uh, to Susan, and it's regarding, we have the opportunity with the book in the OER space to be really creative and unconventional. So I think when we think about community as not being, as not being, um, you know, one dimensional, that including stories such as uh, Susan's point of fired and being fired or any of those, those uh, things that really happen to us in the community, I think would make the book unique and, and not be just the, the great, you know, not just be stories of, of, um, of how we, you know, move through the community and work with the community, et cetera. But yeah, but just, I, I really like the point um, in moving away, from, not moving away, but the inclusion, right, of both the traditional stories and stories that are not uh, conventional. And that one certainly would, would I think, be helpful. Um, I've, I've been in that space, so I know what that is. And when, when uh, Judah said that and Ann mentioned it, I said, yeah, we should tell those stories, right? I mean, because they all, <laughs> no, they do. They lend, to, they lend to who we become today. They mm -hmm. lend to starting your own businesses and, uh, you know, your, mod, your own models, et cetera. So I think that's really important. And we would be on top of, uh, uh, you know, we would, that would be trending or we would be, uh, uh, pioneers and making sure they hear uh, the audience hears real stories about all aspects of, of working in the community. So yeah, thank so, you. So, so I'll put out an invitation for anybody who wants to put together a conversation for February on, uh, on, on a topic like that and circulate it and get other people who want to be part of that nice. panel. That'd be great. Yeah. And thank you so much. Um, it was a wonderful presentation and it clearly triggered fascinating discussions, which is always the sign of a successful uh, presentation. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to come and join us. Uh, everybody remember that in January, it's January 21st uh, at noon Eastern uh, for uh, Dawn Henderson, who we all love, and Dr. William Jackson, who she works with in her new position. Um, have a wonderful holiday, and we will see you in the new year. And anybody who has ideas for other sessions, please email me.
Thank you, Ann. Yep. Thanks, uh, Tom. We'll talk to Judah and I are talking about uh, a February uh, practice um, presentation on. Hi, everybody. 